I should have been on top of this. There's an elephant in the room surrounding the FTX story, and no one seems to be talking about it. That doesn't mean they're criminals. I did not know that there is any improper use of customer funds. You guys asked us to make this video, but we didn't want to do yet another retelling of what happened or what's happening. Sam Bankman fried is a criminal. He ran his company irresponsibly, but that's not the worst part about the collapse of FTX. The pension plan has a $95 million per capital investment. Million of employees after declaring that it held its assets FTX. Million dollar valuation from some of the biggest names in venture capital. It's what it says about people trusting him. I'm going to explain what happened with FTX in this video. Don't worry about it, but it's not the point of the video. For Bitcoin or for any other cryptocurrency to actually become a currency, to actually play a part in our future, we need to trust it first. And FTX is just the latest case that shows how greed, market manipulation, personal feuds get in the way of a potentially revolutionizing piece of tech. Bankman fried speaks terribly about how time and time again, we have put trust in the wrong person. And the future of this crypto revolution hangs in the balance. The story of the rise of crypto is full of these iconic moments. But before that, I need to talk about today's sponsor, which is actually our own Slidebean agency team. Now, you'd think that Slidebean Media, which is the YouTube team, is everything that we do, but that's not the case. For 10 years now, we've been helping companies tell their own company stories. In 2021, for example, over $300 million were raised with our help, with pitch decks that we helped write or redesign, which is essentially kind of capturing a company's own story and making it exciting for investors. That's what we're really good at company storytelling and YouTube is just one way in which we brag about this and of course get some extra exposure now let me get back to this video the story of the rise of crypto is full of these iconic moments it's it's that anonymous founder that we still don't know who it was it, it's that pair of pizzas that somebody bought for 10,000 Bitcoin back when it was worth nothing Freedom 2.0, which brought us something called Bitcoin. We'd all be heralding it as the most important financial revolution since the internet. Have you ever heard of Bitcoin? It's a digital currency that exists only online. Tell you the truth, I, I also don't get it. Cryptocurrencies have made people a lot of money. We've seen those stories. We're bombarded with them by the influencers in social media. And of course, that creates FOMO, but for every new crypto millionaire, there are thousands of people who lost, who bet at the wrong time and lost. And they probably took their losses quietly. They, they have no one to blame for themselves, right? They were just trying to bet in the wrong thing, and, and they obviously don't want to call attention. But everybody, winners and losers, everybody has to go through an exchange. A crypto exchange uh, is like any other exchange. It's somewhere that you can go and trade crypto assets, crypto coins, whatever you'd like to call them. And the stories and the crashes related to crypto exchanges are some big stains in that exciting crypto story. Stories that question how much we can trust the humans that build businesses around crypto. Who bought an NFT? NFT. NFT. It's worse than tulip bulbs. It'll eventually blow up. It's a fraud. New technology is, is hard to build. We, we need to learn from mistakes. We need to invest money. We need to take risks in order to evolve that tech. And that's a natural process. But new tech, especially tech that not everybody understands very well, is also a ripe ground for scammers. I'm sure thousands of people have lost money in these scams. I was close to falling for many, myself, more than once, but that dream story of crypto is tainted by these massive scandals surrounding exchanges. Let me tell you a couple. For example, back in 2010. And so you, you made that? You made yep. the program? Yeah. Most crypto <laughs> trading happened on an exchange called Mt. Gox, based in Japan. Jeff McAuliffe founded it and it grew like crazy, in part because there was little competition, but also because people trusted this nerdy, seemingly harmless individual. They trusted the platform was secure and reliable, but the exchange itself was really a piece of software. Funny story, originally built to trade Magic the Gathering. God damn it, God damn it! And then one winter day in 2014, it was hacked. My hope is that, that they are there and I'm here today to get answers. I want to know, do I have, are these coins going to be safe? Japanese police have arrested the head of the Mt. Gox Bitcoin exchange, Mark Carpolese. An exchange is an easy business. It, it connects people looking to sell or buy something and they just take a tiny percentage commission when the sale happens. It, it's, a, it's a bit of a money machine, but they deal with a lot of money. They need to have a lot of assets stored to allow for the exchanges to happen. And when Mt. Gox was hacked in 2014, hackers stole 850,000 Bitcoin, which was worth $450 million at the time. Just gone. This wasn't company money. It was the customers 
money. Okay, I came all the way from London, all the way from London to try and get my Bitcoins from you. Bitcoin is an incredibly secure and solid piece of tech, and we're gonna talk about that in a sec. And, and you can store Bitcoin on a flash drive or even on a piece of paper, and no one ever can hack that password. It's impossible. That's called cold storage because it's outside the web. And again, it's truly impossible to get access to a wallet in cold storage. But in order to exchange Bitcoin, you need to store your money in the exchange, which is that piece of software. It's on the web. It's run by a company that's run by flawed humans. And to this day, we still don't know the final details of the hack or what happened or who was to blame. But the CEO of the company at the time went to jail for embezzling funds. Now, the founder of Mt. Gox has not gone to jail, but his actions around the time make him a bit of a suspect still. It's not that the tech behind cryptocurrencies failed. It was either a critical human mistake in the exchange software or corruption inside the company. Now, another terrible blow in trust came from Quadriga, another exchange based out of Canada, founded in 2013. Thousands of clients have millions of dollars in frozen assets. And along with his death, the problem here is also access to his laptop. Yeah, I pretty much ended up uh, losing my life savings because of it. Remember how I told you that you can store your cryptocurrencies in these cult wallets? They're unhackable unless you know the password? Well, on a trip to India in 2018, the company founder, Gerald Cotton, died. And with him, the passwords to the company's wallets, where around $200 million worth of assets were stored. Passwords were not written anywhere, nobody had access to them, nobody else knew the passwords, and nobody could find them, so much so that the company had to file for bankruptcy a few months later. Now, one of the reasons why the founders and executives running these exchanges rise to fame is because people look to them for trust. People want to see who's behind the company. And in both of these stories, the founder of the company was a trusted individual, a magnet personality that people trusted with their money. The official cause for both of these crashes seems to be human error, a password lost, or a password hacked, but it's not that simple. Foul play is suspected in both cases, and it's not unfounded. The CEO of Mt. Gox went to jail. The founder was a suspect. And in Quadriga's case, the circumstances around Cotton's death are very suspicious. Many people still believe his death was faked. We made a whole video about it. And so the very same year Quadriga died, a nerdy looking Californian kid, son of two Stanford professors, decided to start his own exchange. The whole thing was just one, one big Ponzi scheme. At the end of the day, you know, it's not my call what happens and uh, the world will judge me as it will. Sam beckman fried had started another company called Alameda Research, which did quant trading, and they were really good at it. When you buy Bitcoin at $60,000 and then you have to sell it for $15,000, you've made a normal, a very shitty, but a normal trade. Quant trading uses complex algorithms, mathematical models, advanced stuff that I won't even pretend to understand to do this thousands of times a day. They quickly made millions of dollars, which got people's attention, and it earned Sam enough credibility to start his own exchange, FTX. And the media? Well, the media fell in love with this guy. Sam Bankman-Fried quickly rose as the savior What's up, guys? I'm here with my boy Sam. It's going to be a celebration of Giselle and Sam's shared passion for making the world a better place. Sam has crazy hair. Sam is vegan. Sam sleeps five hours a night. Sam lives in the Bahamas. Beyond how good of a trader or a coder or a founder he was, people fell in love with his nerdy character, like the seemingly uninterested in getting rich. You talk to 10 people that that knew Sam, nine of them are, are, are gonna say what a wonderful guy he was, and I'm one of those. Earning to give is thinking about which causes, which charities save the most lives per dollar. This hundred dollars can go as far as it possibly can to help the world. People trusted him. Investors trusted him to fund the company, and they trusted his exchange to make the trades. And FTX grew like wildfire. Investors keep pouring money into the industry. Closure of an almost $421 it's like million. A business dollars. That is, uh, much more for sophisticated trader. Oh boy, I mean. It raised a lot of money from investors, and not these new crypto millionaires, but actual real prestigious decades of experience venture capital firms. Now remember, an exchange by default will let you trade. Just exchange one currency for the other profit of the tiny percentage. But FTX did a lot of other things, and one of them was allow customers to do staking. I'm not gonna explain that right now. Essentially, you could deposit money into your account in any currency, including US dollars, and it would earn a solid, constant, guaranteed interest of 8% 
per year, as long as you kept the money there. Now that shitty certificate of deposit from your bank pays you 1% per year if you're super lucky. And these guys are offering 8% and you didn't even have to buy crypto, you just keep your USD in the platform. That's, that's fantastic, right? Well, exactly a year ago, in January 2022, FTX had grown to a valuation of $32 billion, less than three years after starting. It even started a $2 billion fund to invest in other crypto startups. So as a VC, you could put money in FTX as an investment. As an individual, you could pretend to guess what cryptocurrency was growing and then trade on FTX. And as a company or as a pension fund, you could keep your assets in FTX and earn that 5 to 8% yield. Ideally, the people who invested in FTX understood what they were doing, and I'm sure some didn't, but mainly people trusted Sam Bankman fried Yes, they were taking a risk. They were jumping on this making money hype train too. But if the company is backed by the top firms in the world, if the money is safe, why shouldn't you? And for a time, this was good. And this SBF persona rose even more. A young self-made billionaire, one of the hundred richest people in the world before 30, magazine covers, media attention. Not only that, a philanthropist swearing that the money is irrelevant to him, promising billions of dollars in donations to nonprofits. The amount of good that you can do uh, for the future of the world is, is really large and it's way more than you can do to actually make yourself happy. How can we not trust a guy like that? Now, I'm not gonna pretend that you don't know where this story is going, but I promise that this video wouldn't be just about this. So I'm gonna summarize what we know so far in the simplest way possible. Now we're shooting this video in December, 2022. These videos take a while to edit. SPF is still free. He hasn't been arrested yet, but I am pretty sure he will. Either way, here's January me with the latest details. Well, that guy was actually right about something for once. SPF has been arrested. He was charged and he will go to trial in October. But as the dust has settled, as more people have started to dig into what actually happened, with a shout out to CoffeeZilla for all the research that he did and how his channel blew up, we now have a much clearer picture of what happened. So here's the slight bean stop motion story. Remember I told you that SPF started Alameda and he did pretty well with Alameda. When he moved to start FTX, he had to appoint a new CEO to run this previous company and that's her, Caroline Ellison. Now for a lot of legal reasons, it was critical that these companies remained independent, but that never really happened. SPF still owned 90% of Alameda and Caroline and SPF were dating. So yeah, these companies were really intertwined, but I'm gonna get to that in a sec. A key concept that you need to understand in this whole mess is FTT. FTT is a token, think of it like the exchange's own currency. It's a currency created by FTX and it trades. It trades to US dollars or to Bitcoin and people could exchange it and its price was defined by supply and demand just like any other currency. Now remember, the idea of an exchange is to provide a place for trades to happen. The exchange makes money from tiny transaction fees. So as a customer, you need to have money in an exchange in order to make these trades. And with FTX, you could earn interest if you allowed your park money to be lent to others. But here's the trick. You had a lot of special benefit if you stored your money in FTT rather than Bitcoin or US dollars. And so people did, and the price went up because people liked the benefits. A lot of companies stored their assets on FTT and one of them was Alameda. Now, the beginning of this mess really starts with a Coindesk report on November 2nd, 2022. It revealed that about 40% of Alameda's assets were stored in FTT. Now, assets for a trading company like this essentially mean capital that the company owns and that they can use as collateral to borrow more money to make more trades. And these assets usually need to be tangible things. And the fact that so much of those supposedly tangible things were FTT was bad. It meant first that the companies were intertwined. It meant that the value might have been inflated because the FTT token was volatile in its price. And check this one out, a huge part of the total FTT supply, the tokens in circulation, 86% of them were owned by either Alameda or Sam Bankman fried which meant that these guys were ultimately controlling the supply of this token and therefore the price. And things moved really, really fast after this report. Four days later, Binance, the largest crypto exchange in the world today, announced that they would sell all of the FTT that they owned. They had some because they were investors in the company. Both CEOs had a fight on Twitter, which brought a lot of eyes into the mess. And of course, people panicked. Now they not only withdrew the money from the platform, they sent the price of FTT to the floor. This happened over three days. If you're not following the news, you would wake up 
three days later to a lot of your money erased. Quite a crazy chart. We spoke about it yesterday, that there could have been a cheeky little little entry there. It's gonna but... recover, it's gonna pump just because you know. By November 9th, FTX had to block withdrawals from the platform because they ran out of money to pay people. Now, there is already some shady stuff happening with all of that, but it wasn't the smoking gun. There was maybe some fraud, but not full on fraud. Here's the real deal. When people put their money in FTX, well, it's, it's the people's money. They're just storing it on the exchange, like in a bank. Now you could opt to keep your money there in US dollars or in FTT or in any currency. If you chose to have it in FTT and then the value of FTT drops, well, that's your mistake. It was a bad trade. But you could also opt in to do staking or margin trading or a bunch of other complicated financial stuff, which meant that you were allowing your money, for example, to be lent to others in exchange for this interest rate that FTX was paying. And this had a risk, of course. But if you didn't opt in for that, then FTX legally couldn't do anything with your money. They need to keep it there because it's yours. And of course, pay it back whenever you need it. Now, when withdrawals were blocked in November, this revealed that FTX might not have all the assets that they should have. It revealed that they might have spent some of that money that wasn't there. For treating all the clients the same when they clearly signed up to different terms of service. Process withdrawals as we normally do until it became clear we couldn't anymore, at which point we shut them off. And it was the case, there was a, a big liquidity hole. For example, FTX might have lent about $10 billion to Alameda from the pool of the customer's money. Alameda had been struggling, they had debt to pay, and SBF apparently allowed money to flow between these companies. That would be the fraud part. FTX also did a buyback of shares from Binance, who was their shareholder, which might have cost them a few billion dollars. So I simply called Sam Bankman Fried and said, where is the money, Sam? Where did you spend it? And then he told me about a transaction that occurred over the last 24 months, the repurchase of his shares from Binance, his competitor. I didn't know this at the time, but at some point, CZ or Binance purchased 20% ownership in Sam Bankman Fried's firm for seed stock. Later in a subsequent conversation, about 24 hours later, he told me it could have been as much as $3 billion to buy back the shares from CZ. I asked him, what would compel you to do that? They brought homes for SBF and other employees and maybe, maybe they also used some of the customer's funds for that, which was a shit show. It's just a major shit show. By November 11th, they had filed for bankruptcy that same day and apparent hack stole almost $500 million from FTX's account. During all of this time, SBF was desperate to raise money or to get some other exchange to acquire and bail them out, and nobody did. Then this guy, John Ray III, came in as CEO to oversee the bankruptcy and the liquidation, which is a normal practice to bring an external person to do it. He worked on the Enron bankruptcy, and he said, sort of quoting, never in his career had he seen a shit show like the one happening in FTX. A bunch of VCs accepted that they just lost all the money that they had invested and wrote it off. Celebrities that had invested or, or been paid to endorse FTX, like Giselle Bunchen, they had lawsuits directed at them. The value of Bitcoin and many other cryptocurrencies dropped around the mess, though Bitcoin at least has sort of recovered by now. I might be wrong with the time this video releases next week. That's just the price of Bitcoin. But anyway, FTX has been arrested, charged, is under home arrest today at his parents' place in Palo Alto, a town I visited, by the way, a couple weeks back on our Silicon Valley dystopia video. His bond is $250 million, just a random number. Gary Wang, SBF's co-founder, and Carolyn Ellison both pleaded guilty, but as of today, SBF still claims to be innocent. But regardless of what the story was, it's once again greed or stupidity, but either way, humans at fault. The technology is a constant, but people aren't, and every scandal makes us lose trust in what cryptocurrencies can be. Now, back to December me who doesn't know all the details. Now, regardless of what's gonna happen in the next few weeks, the broader question is, what will this do to crypto? Will it affect its chances of becoming something that everyone uses? Can we still trust cryptocurrencies? Going back to some basic economics concepts, courtesy of the Economics Explained guy, there are three things needed for a currency to be a currency. It needs to be universally accepted. Okay, not there, but a trend in the right direction. It needs to be stable, and I'm not even gonna talk about that. But most importantly, it's confidence, which is another word 
for trust. And for the most part, we can trust the blockchain technology. It's secure, virtually unhackable. It creates this unprecedented transparency, thanks to which I'm sure a lot of the details in this FTX case are gonna be revealed. And it's decentralized. It's run by a community. The foundation is solid, but not the next layer. I'm sure that SPF is gonna get arrested at some point, but there's a bit of an irony here, isn't there? Wasn't crypto all about decentralizing? How many crypto investors hate the Federal Reserve and the central banks? How many of them are speaking out against their interest rates and, and their inflation? And yet, it's the government who once again we look up to for justice for this scammer, probably, because I don't really know if he's been trialed yet. But anyway, hundreds of thousands of people put their trust in Bankman Freed. That includes anyone from the guy trying to get rich fast by trading crypto to the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. It was politicians who trusted him to accept $60 million in campaign donations. It seems that this is a human nature thing, this desperation to find a hero to cling to. It seems to make us ignore the flags and double down. Two weeks after the collapse of FTX, when the signs were already super clear, SBF came up with a statement supporting the journalists covering his own demise. And with that silly move, he still managed to get rally support around him to keep their trust. Our native hope is that this time will be different. We're willing to forgive the SBFs of the world. We want to believe that this time it's going to be different. We are desperately clinging to the hope of that hero. I don't know how many more blows in trust the crypto market can support. They're too big, they're too public. And if this keeps happening, this incredibly solid piece of tech will meet its doom because we'll just never be able to trust it. Thanks a lot for watching.